All right, physics class, this is day 60. It is May the 19th, 2020, and we are just exactly three weeks from the last day of school today. Uh, so what we're going to do is finish our lesson on light waves and optics. We're going to watch another uh, 15, about 15 minute segment of the same video you saw yesterday. It's the professor from um, Middlebury College in Vermont, and he's going to explain light and optics to you. And um, all you have to do is answer the questions, and they should be pretty straightforward if you watch the video, and then submit those. Uh, if you're having difficulties uh, submitting, you can be in touch with me. I'm around my computer pretty much seven days a week, um, and I'll answer your emails pretty quickly, or you can call me. Again, you should have a syllabus, and if you don't, email me or well, just let me know in some way. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and... Um, We'll complete the uh, the uh, section here, the lessons on light waves and optics. Being a virtual image of my notes, the image is behind the lens somewhere, or the light looks like it's coming from behind the lens, but light isn't really coming from the point where the virtual image seems to be. But nevertheless, I see this enlarged enlargement of the of the text on the notes from this simple magnifying glass. This same lens could make both real images and virtual images depending on whether the object is placed closer to the lens than the focal distance or further away. So that's the formation of a virtual image. Now, you'll notice that with both these images, I used exactly the same kind of lens. It was a, a lens that was concave, it, 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 uh, or convex, I'm sorry. It was a convex lens. The, the sides of the lens both bulged out. By the way, it would have still worked if one side had been flat and another had bulged out. It even would have worked if one was concave and one was convex, provided the lens got thicker in the middle. That kind of lens is called a converging lens. It brings parallel light rays together at a focus. There's another kind of lens called a diverging lens, and let me go over to my blackboard again and put on a diverging lens. Here, here's a converging lens. It brings light rays together at a focus. Here's a diverging lens. It sends light rays apart. They look like they're coming from a focus that's over here somewhere. So in a sense, the focal distance of this one is, re in, is reversed and uh, to handle that mathematically, we assign this one a negative focal distance. Those of you who are nearsighted, as opposed to me, I'm farsighted, those of you who are nearsighted have negative diopter prescriptions for your eyeglasses and contact lenses because you need diverging lenses. And I'll show you why in just a minute. So these diverging lenses can never form real images because the light is never being brought together to focus, but they can form uh, virtual images and that's what they do for you in your eyeglasses. Well, let's look at your eyes a little bit and see how your eyes work. Um, first of all, let's look at a normal eye. And I'm going to put up here a little eye diagram. And get it aligned right with the laser. OK. So here I have a source of parallel light. And here I have what would be a normal eye. If you have a normal eye, there's a lens, there's actually also in front of the lens this transparent layer called the cornea, and most of the refraction actually occurs at the cornea. So the eye doesn't have just a single refractive element. It has the cornea and then it has a lens. And the lens actually, particularly in younger people, a set of muscles can adjust the curvature of the lens to focus at nearer and farther distances. And what happens to most of us as we get older is that lens becomes stiffer and it can no longer make that adjustment. And that's when we begin to start needing, for example, reading glasses. So it's a little more complicated than this diagram would suggest, but but there is a normal eye, and a normal eye brings parallel light together at a focus uh, at the back of the eye. So let's take a little bit more look here at the eye's um, anatomy to see what's going on, actually. At the front is the cornea, which is, again, shaped somewhat lens-like to provide some of the refraction that brings that light together. Behind that is a lens. That's the movable, deformable element that allows you to adjust the focus. At the back is the retina. That's where the image is formed and then captured by uh, cells, special cells called rods and cones that convert that to nerve impulses and send it to your brain. So here is going to be a farsighted eye. A farsighted eye has a lens that is a little bit too weak. It doesn't deflect the light enough. It ends up focusing the light behind your retina, or it would have focused the light behind your retina if the light could have gone through your retina. So that's a, uh, a lens which is too weak. So if I go to my model, that would be a model of a defective 
I defective in the sense of being farsighted. I happen to be farsighted, so I'll pick on this one. And you can see the light has not yet converged to a focus at the point it hits the retina. It's converging to a focus somewhere behind the retina. So that's a farsighted eye. Um, let's pause a second. Let me ask you to stop your DVD player for a minute or your VHS player, your, your um, uh, video cassette player, and pause a minute and think, what would you do to correct this? The lens is not strong enough. It's not converging the light tightly enough to a focus. What would you do? Well, what you would do is put something in front of there that would make the convergence happen more uh, dramatically, something that would add a little extra convergence. So you'd put a lens that would achieve more convergence, something like this. Okay, I'm going to put another converging lens in front of the too weak convergence of my cornea and my internal lens. That converging lens is going to take those rays of light that are coming from the object. It's going to bring them a little bit more tightly together so that when they get to my eye, my eye can bring them together at the focus. I've suggested the converging lens looks like all these other lenses I've been drawing. It might actually be shaped more like that, especially if it were a contact lens. So that's what I'm going to do over here. I'm going to take a slightly converging lens, not a very strong one, but a little bit, I'm going to put it here in front of the eye, and now the light is coming together at pretty much the retina, focused at the right place, and I've corrected that vision. So those of you who have positive diopter measurements on your contact lenses or your glasses, your vision is corrected in this way with a converging lens in front of the eye. That's correction of farsightedness. What about nearsightedness? Um, nearsightedness is the opposite condition. Um, in nearsightedness, the eye is too strong. It focuses the light to a focus before it hits the retina. So here it is, and by the time the light reaches the retina, it's no longer in focus. So what are you going to do? Pause a minute and think about that. Well, what you're going to do is diverge those rays somewhat so that you won't have that problem. So that you put a lens in that spreads those rays a little bit further apart, so by the time the converging lenses get working on them in your eye, they'll bring them together at the focus at the right place. So by correcting nearsightedness, we're going to put a diverging lens, something like that. I'll show you in a minute. It doesn't actually look like that. It's going to take the light that's headed toward your eye, spread it a bit further apart, so by the time it hits your eye, the focus will be in the right place. The diverging lenses typically don't actually look like that. Again, all that matters is that they be thinner at the center. That's enough to make them diverging lenses, so they might look something like that. So let's go over and do that on our uh, model eye over here. So there's the lens that was stronger. That was my number two lens that had the shorter focal distance, and that number two lens brings things to a focus before the retina, and so we need to spread things out a little bit, and so we'll put a diverging lens in front, and again, we've achieved a perfect focus. So that's how eyeglasses and, in general, vision correction works. We simply put lenses in front of the eye that compensate for those problems, and if we understand those simple two rays, the one that goes through the center of the lens and the one that goes parallel to the axis, that's all we really need to understand the correction of the most simple vision problems. Correct astigmatism is a little more involved. You have to make a new lens with itself, different shapes um, to, uh, to handle the different curvatures. And if you want a contact lens that corrects astigmatism, that's a real problem because you've got to make sure the contact lens floats into the right orientation so it's got to be weighted. That gets a little complicated. If you want a more permanent vision correction, you can go in for laser surgery. How does that work? Well, in laser vision correction, uh, you basically take a laser, much more about lasers in Lecture 34. Um, the lasers that are used in laser vision correction can actually etch words into a human hair. They're that precise. And they uh, ablate off, burn off, boil off, uh, sp uh, sputter off little tiny bits of matter at the eye. And typically what they do is uh, take the center of the cornea, uh, they First, remove surgically, flip back the cornea and the outer layer, and they uh, just reshape the cornea slightly in such a way, as you can see in the rightmost frame in this picture, um, the lens is now a little bit thinner than it was at the center, and that makes it a little bit more diverging. It cuts down on the converging properties. Remember, the nearsighted person was too, had too strong a lens. It was converging too much, and so this solves that problem. Laser vision correction also works for, for uh, farsightedness, which is what I have, but it doesn't work quite as well because it's not as easy to make the cornea thicker in the center. You have to ablate stuff away from the edges, and that's a little harder to do. And so those of us who are farsighted are slightly worse candidates for laser vision correction, although it can still be done. So that's a more modern uh, vision correction technique, which basically uses still the same principles of optics. Um, 
That's single lenses, uh, putting an uh, extra lens in front of your eyes makes a more complicated instrument, your eye lenses plus these additional lenses. Um, we've made all kinds of scientific instruments, telescopes, microscopes, which typically involve using one lens, or in the case of astronomical telescopes, a mirror to form an image. And then uh, a second lens looks at that image, that's the eyepiece lens, magnifies it, looks at it, makes a virtual image, and we see that. So uh, that's the development of telescopes and microscopes. Microscopy, again, as I said in the last lecture, is limited because we can't look at objects much smaller than the wavelength of light. So we've developed a whole host of new microscope techniques that don't use optics and get around that issue. Now, once we've made images, sometimes we'd like to save those images. The images you're watching on your screen right now have been captured, saved to some medium. In fact, initially they were saved to high quality uh, beta magnetic tape and later transferred to DVD. Um, how does that work? Well, in old-fashioned cameras, we use film, which is simply a chemical medium that changes chemical properties when light hits it, and the whole complicated, slow development process you take film through then brings out that image that was stored chemically in the film. Uh, did, uh, Film cameras are decreasing rapidly in popularity. They've been replaced by digital cameras, and digital cameras use devices called charge-coupled devices. There are several other kinds of devices. But I just want to give you a sense of how a modern uh, camera works, how a modern camera remembers its images. So here's an example of a charge-coupled device. Um, a charge-coupled device can be thought of as sort of like a bunch of, like an egg carton. Now think of an empty egg carton, and you throw into this egg carton some little pellets, and each little pellet represents a certain amount of light. And the more light coming into an individual little well in the egg carton, uh, the, the brighter the light, and therefore the more of these pellets. Well, those pellets are electrons. And in a charge-coupled device, one typically has an array of these light-sensitive sites. They're called photocytes or pixels. A pixel is a common word that you'll hear in the digital era. So here is a representation of that. This particular camera, if this were a camera, has 1, 2, 3, 4 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 4 times 6. That's 24 pixels. A typical camera today has maybe 5 million pixels. Uh, a camera I happened to look at just before coming here had 2272 by 1704 pixels. If you multiply those two numbers together, you get close to 4 million. So that's a 4 megapixel camera. So this is a very small number of pixels. We really have millions and millions of them in our camera. So here comes light through the lens of the camera. And each of these red particles coming in is a little particle of light, a little bundle of light energy. And when it hits the CCD array, it releases an electron. So the red particle, the light disappears, and in its place, there forms an electron. So here we've collected a bunch of light in this charge-coupled device. That is some kind of image. It shows a region that looks sort of like, oh, I don't know, maybe a little bit like the letter F, kind of out of focus. Um, but there's regions where there's more light has, has in the image and regions where there's less light. And so now we've got this array, this egg crate kind of thing, with electrons filling the bins, and we'd like to get those electrons out of there. So. The beautiful thing about a charge-coupled device is the charge can be coupled from one of these bins to the next. The electrons can be moved to the next bin. So what happens is electronically, we apply electronic signals for some electronic circuitry that first shift all those electrons one bin over, then another bin over, then they begin to come out of the CCD and they're registered by the electronic circuitry, which registers the amount and eventually stores in a computer memory or whatever. Next, next, and now we've got that row read out. Then we start reading out the next row and so on, and you get the picture. So that's how a charge-coupled device works. That's how we store images. Cameras, our eyes, uh, VHS tape, beta tape, uh, digital uh, camcorders, all these things record actual images, focused light. But there's another way to form an image, and that's actually to capture the light rays as if they were coming to your eye and recreate that light as if it's coming to your eye. That doesn't form an image, but instead it forms something more complicated, whereas if you look at it, you see the actual scene you were looking at in three dimensions. That's called a hologram. A hologram is made by by interfering light that's bouncing off an object from a laser with light coming directly from the laser, what that and then recording that on film or in some other medium, what that does is to create the actual wave fronts that were coming at you exactly as they were, and you can actually see things in three dimensions. And I have here at the end of this lecture a movie that uh, was made. It's from the MIT Media Lab, and it's uh, I can't show this well in two dimensions, but I'll do the best I can. It's a movie that shows um, a hologram of a car, and the fact that it's three-dimensional 
is indicated by the fact that as we move the hologram around, you see the car from different angles. You are really seeing essentially a three-dimensional image. And I think in the coming decades, we can expect to see full-length movies, maybe on Blu-ray DVDs or something, that are actually holographic and appear not on a screen, but in full three dimensions.